Chapter 11, Earthquakes. What is an earthquake? An earthquake is the vibration of Earth produced by rapid release of energy. Energy is released, radiates in all directions from its source, which is the focus. The energy is in form of waves. Sensitive instruments around the world record the event. Okay, so here we have a fault, and here's where, where the earthquake occurred, and that's the focus. And energy travels in all directions, 360 degrees, all the way around like a sphere. These are seismic waves that travel out. The point on the land surface right above the focus, that's the epicenter of the earthquake. Earthquakes and faults. Movements that produce earthquakes are usually associated with large fractures in the Earth's crust called faults. Most of the motion along faults can be explained by plate tectonics theory. Elastic rebound. The mechanism for earthquakes is first explained by H.F. Reed. Rocks on both sides of an existing fault are deformed by tectonic forces. Rocks bend and store elastic energy. Frictional resistance holds the rocks together and then is overcome. Then the earthquake, the slippage is at the weakest point, at the focus, and the vibrations occur as the deformed rocks spring back to the original shape, called the elastic rebound. Earthquakes most often occur along existing faults whenever the friction forces on the fault surface are overcome. And so here, there had been an earthquake in this farm, and these trees had originally planted all in nice neat rows. There's a fault that goes through here, and this placement was in this direction and this direction. So now the trees have a zigzag in their rows. Here's where a fence was, was uh, um, cut across by a fault line. So the, so the movement was in this direction and this direction. Foreshocks and aftershocks. Adjustments that follow a major earthquake often generate smaller earthquakes called aftershocks. Small earthquakes called foreshocks often precede a major earthquake by days or in some cases as much as several years. San Andreas is an active earthquake zone. San Andreas is the most studied fault system in the world. It's in California. Displacement occurs along discrete segments 100 to 200 kilometers long. Some portions exhibit slow, gradual displacement called fault creep. Other segments regularly slip, producing small earthquakes. Still other segments store elastic energy for hundreds of years before rupturing in great earthquakes. This process described is a stick-slip motion. Great earthquakes should occur by every 50 to 200 years along these sections. So here's the uh, San Andreas Fault System. Here's the main uh, portion of the fault. Um, somewhere in Los Angeles, the, uh, the Rose Bowl is, is uh, actually built right on the uh, San Andreas Fault. Seismology is the study of earthquake waves. Seismology dates back almost 2,000 years to the Chinese. Seismographs are instruments that record seismic rays, waves. Re records, this records the movement of Earth in relation to a stationary mass on a rotating drum or magnetic tape. Okay, so here we have our seismograph, and it's anchored to some bedrock. Okay, so then we have a stationary, or stationary pen here and a rotating drum. And if the ground should shake, okay, then the drum is going to move relative to the pen and it's going to mark the wavelength, the wave heights. Seismographs, more than one type of seismograph is needed to record both vertical and horizontal ground motion. Record, records are obtained are called seismograms. Okay, so seismogram to a seismograph is like a telegrams to a telegraph. So seismogram is the report, the, the seismograph is the machine types of seismic waves. We have surface waves. They travel along the outer part of the Earth. They have a complex motion, cause greatest destruction, exhibit the greatest amplitude, so they're the highest wave heights, and slowest velocity. Waves have the greatest periods with time travel between crests, often referred to as long waves or L waves. Body waves are the waves that travel through Earth's interior. There are two types based on mode of travel. Primary waves, or P waves, are the push-pull, compressed, expand motion, changing the volume of the intervening material. They travel through solids, liquids, and gases. Primary waves, P waves, generally in any solid material, P waves travel about 1.7 times faster than S waves. Now, S waves are secondary waves. They're the shake motion at right angles to the direction of travel. They travel only through solids. They're slower than P waves slightly greater amplitude than P waves. 
The focus is a place within the Earth where the earthquake waves originate. The epicenter is the location on the surface directly above the focus. The epicenter is located using the difference in velocities of P and S waves. So how do we locate that epicenter? We need three seismograph recordings are needed to locate the epicenter. Each station determines the time interval between the arrival of the first P wave and the arrival of the first S wave at the location. Then use a time travel graph to determine each station's distance from the epicenter. So here, here's our background. So here's our first P wave, and there's our first S wave. So we count how many minutes? Let's say one, two, three, four, so five minutes have lapsed between when the first P wave and the first S wave showed up. Now we use a time travel graph. Okay, So we look on the left side, there's that time difference between the P and the S wave arrivals, there's the five minutes, and we follow it across until we meet the time curve, and then we drop down, and we're about 3,400 kilometers from the epicenter. Okay, so then we need to draw a circle with a radius equal to that distance around, each, around that station. And we do the same thing for two more stations. Where all three circles intersect the earthquake, that's the epicenter. So we just looked at data for Nagpur station. So we draw a circle 3,400 kilometers around that station. Then Darwin station is 4,900 kilometers, so we draw that circle. And then Paris is 8,200 kilometers away. And where all three circles intersect, that is where the epicenter of the earthquake is. Okay, measuring the size of an earthquake. Two measurements that describe the size of an earthquake are the intensity, okay, a measure of the degree of earthquake shaking at a given locale based on the amount of damage, and magnitude estimates the amount of energy released at the source of the earthquake. The modified Mercalli intensity scale was developed using California buildings as a standard. The drawback of intensity scales is that destruction may not be a true measure of earthquake's actual severity. In an example of modified Mercalli intensity scale, it ranges in Roman numerals from 1 through 12, it ranges from not felt except by very few under special circumstances, all the way to damage is total, waves are seen around surfaces, objects are thrown upward in the air. Somewhere in the middle, everybody feels it, many are frightened to run outdoors, some heavy furniture is moved, few instances of fallen plaster or damaged chimneys, damage is slight. Okay, so this is by observing the damage caused for you to figure out where you are on the modified Macaulay intensity scale. Now magnitude scales, a little more precise, look more at the energy. The Richter magnitude concept was introduced by Charles Richter in 1935. It's the Richter scale based on the amplitude of the largest seismic wave recorded for that earthquake. It accounts for the decrease in wave amplitude with increase in distance. Okay, so if the seismograph st station is farther away from an earthquake, it's going to have a smaller amplitude. So it takes that into account when it figures it out. The largest magnitude recorded on a Wood Anderson seismograph was 8.9. Magnitudes less than 2.0 are, or <laughs> less than 2.0, are not felt by humans. Each unit of Richter magnitude increase corresponds to a tenfold increase in wave amplitude and a 32-fold energy increase. Okay, so a 2 is 32 times as energetic as a 1. Okay, in this chart we're looking at the magnitude of earthquake versus its energy equivalent. Okay, so a 2, not much, not really much energy. But let's see, uh, um, let's see a 3, magnitude 3 in the Richter scale. It's enough uh, equal energy to the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, let's see, a 5 might be just a little stronger than the average tornado. Okay, a 6 is moderately damaging and just a little weaker than the Hiroshima atomic bomb attack. And let's see, um, you guys may have heard of the Northridge, California quake in 94. Uh, let's see, a strong earthquake like San Francisco in 1906 is equivalent to Mount St. Helens eruption, which was a very violent uh, volcanic eruption in 1980. Uh, let's see, um, Krakatoa uh, was, um, was stronger than the world's largest nuclear test done by Russia. And let's see, largest recorded, uh, greater than from around 9.5 is a Chil Chilean uh, earthquake. And another very large one was the 1964 Alaskan earthquake. 
Other magnitudes, there are several Richter-like magnitude scales that have been developed. The moment magnitude was developed because none of the Richter-like magnitude scales adequately estimated very large earthquakes. So this is derived from the amount of displacement that occurs along the fault. Earthquake, but we're locating the source of earthquake. Well, earthquake belts, around 95% of the energy released by earthquakes originates in very, a few very relatively narrow zones that wind around the globe. Major earthquake zones include the Circum-Pacific Belt, which we know as the Ring of Fire, the Mediterranean Sea region to the Himalayan complex, and the Oceanic Ridge System. So here's our Circum-Pacific Belt, otherwise known as the Ring of Fire, because besides most of our earthquakes happening here, so is most of our volcanoes. Then we have a lot of activity along the Ocean Ridge System, and then along the Mediterranean Himalayan Belt. Earthquake destruction. The amount of structural damage attributable to earthquake vibrations depends on intensity and duration of the vibrations, the nature of the material upon which the structure rests, and the design of the structure. Ground shaking. Regions within 20 to 50 kilometers of the epicenter will experience about the same intensity of ground shaking. However, destruction varies considerably, mainly due to the nature of the ground on which the structures are built. So here is a picture of damage from the 1964 Anchorage, Alaska earthquake. Very large building uh, is collapsing upon itself. Liquefaction of the ground. Unconsolidated material saturated in water will turn into a mobile fluid. Uh, seaches are rhythmic sloshing of water in lakes and reservoirs and enclosed basins. Waves can weaken the reservoir walls and cause destruction. So here's some mud volcanoes produced by, by liquefaction. Tsunamis or seismic sea waves. Destructive waves are often inappropriately called tidal waves, result from vertical displacement along a fault located on the ocean floor, or a large undersea landslide triggered by an earthquake. Uh, the uh, 1964 Alaska earthquake had an undersea landslide um, that triggered a humongous tsunami that hit, um, five hours later, hit Hawaii. In open sea, height usually is less than one meter, uh, the height of the wave amplitude for a tsunami. In shallower coastal water, waters, the water piles up to heights that occasionally exceed 30 meters. They can be very destructive. Also, landslides and ground subsidence are hazards of earthquakes, as well as fire. Here's a tsunami diagram. We have a, we have a subducting plate here, so we have a fault here. And let's say this earthquake happens right here. Well, all this energy is going to, cause, is going to travel through the water. So this huge tsunami wave is only about a meter high. Once it gets closer to shore, it's going to start piling up and forming a very tall wave. It could be up to 30 meters in height. Here's a picture of a tsunami from a 2004 Indian, Indonesian earthquake near Sumatra. Okay, can earthquakes be predicted? Short, wave, short range predictions. The goal is to provide a warning of the location and magnitude of a large earthquake within a narrow time frame. Beach search is concentrated on monitoring possible per precursors, phenomena that precede a forthcoming earthquake, such as measuring uplift, subsidence, and strain in rocks. Currently, no reliable method exists for making short-range earthquake predictions. Long-range forecasts, while well, given the probability of a certain magnitude earthquake occurring on a timescale of 30 to 100 years or more, based on the premise that earthquakes are repetitive or cyclical, so we use historical records or paleoseismology, so are important because they provide information used to develop a uniform building code and assist in land use planning. Okay, evidence for plate tectonics. Earthquakes are definitely evidence for plate tectonics. A good fit exists between plate tectonics model and the global distribution of earthquakes. The connection of deep focus earthquakes and ocean trenches is further evidence. Only shallow focus earthquakes occur along divergent and transform fault boundaries. Earthquakes originate at depths ranging from 5 to nearly 700 kilometers. Earthquake foci are, are, tribular, are arbitrarily classified as shallow, surface to 70 kilometers, intermediate between 70 and 300 kilometers, and deep over 300 kilometers. Shallow focus earthquakes occur along the ocean ridge system. Almost all deep focus earthquakes occur in the Circum-Pacific Belt, particularly in regions situated landward of deep ocean trenches. So here we have a deep ocean trench, okay? and here's, here we're locating the foci of, of all the earthquakes, let's say, we, we've collected along the Tonga Trench here. These up here are shallow ones, 
Here are our intermediate, and here are our deep ones. Okay, so now here we have a map. We're mapping out all these blue ones are shallow earthquakes. Okay, now our intermediate ones and our deep ones are all along the convergent ocean to crust plate boundaries, which is our, our ring of fire here. That's the end of the chapter.